Hello, everybody. Welcome to this week's Hubble. Uh, yeah, we were talking about Hubble Hangouts. Now it's on my brain. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to this week's Telescope Talk. My name is Tony Darnell. I'm from DeepAstronomy.com. And every week, we get together and talk to you about your burgeoning interest in telescopes and the amateur astronomy and they, this hangout is designed to talk to introduce you into the wonderful world and hobby of amateur astronomy and to help you navigate some of the technical problems of getting through um uh all the technology and stuff like that that's out there um one of you guys um i'm still hearing a bit of an echo um i wonder if you guys can mute yourselves and then and then unmute when you get ready to talk can you try that i'm still hearing a bit of a of a hangout, of a uh, of a hangout, of a um, echo. Just mute the just mute the uh, microphone. Okay. So we, today we're going to be talking about the age old question of refractors versus reflectors. Now, one of my favorite shows on television right now is Silicon Valley. It's on HBO, and it's the show about. It's a very nerdy show. It's a comedy about programming, uh, about programming in Silicon Valley and becoming a, an app developer in in Silicon Valley. And there's all these really great behind the scenes jokes in it that if you're not a programmer, you don't get. Like there was this segment on on using the Amazon Web Services, and if you've got a server on that, you know how expensive it can be. And they were busting on that in the show. Well, one of the things they talk about is. They were in one scene. The uh, main character was interviewing for a job, and he didn't hire this programmer, even though he was brilliant, because he used spaces instead of tabs in his text editor. Now, it's a big deal when you're a programmer. I'm personally a spaces man. I use spaces because you can't always count on the size of tabs in in code. So sometimes they're eight spaces, sometimes they're five, and so they're they're not always the same. So I'm a spaces guy. But anyway, the point of that is, it's a it's sort of a behind the scenes, really um, uh, interesting look at programmers, and that's always been a debate among programming people who who are programming nerds is which do they use? And similarly, in amateur astronomy, there is a similar debate about refractors versus reflectors. Now, it's not quite the same because these two telescopes are actually different designs, but there's always this age old argument about which telescope is better, and uh, is it refractors? Is it reflectors? And today we're going to be talking about that uh, very question. We're going to show you what refractors are. We're going to show you what reflectors are, as well as give examples. And we're going to also talk about what each one is good for. Now, I'm going to introduce my co-host in just a minute, but I want to let you know that we're looking at the YouTube chat, our, and as well as the Twitch chat room here. That's the only two I'm looking at right now because even though I am broadcast, oh, and I'm also looking at Facebook, but I'm not doing that as much uh, because not as many people watch on that. So we're also on Facebook. So let me go ahead and bring up my co-hosts. Um, first up, I'll just go with Adam Synergy Smith. Hi, Adam. How are you doing? Hi, Tony. It's good to good have to you back, you. my friend. You are in the UK, and you also run the... I have a lower third few, so I'll put it up. You also run a podcast, right? Unseenpodcast.com? I don't... I can't claim to run the podcast myself. It's a community effort. Okay, actually but you're involved in it. Oh, yes. I, I host it. Oh, okay. So you're it's the host. Uh, created <coughs> by uh, Paul Carr, who does another podcast called the wow signal podcast and it is a great podcast guys i would welcome you guys go to unseenpodcast.com and subscribe listen and uh get involved it's a really great podcast and also joining me is uh these you guys I, i'm calling you my good friends i hope that's okay even though we haven't met in person uh john suffle he is in the uk also an amateur astronomer there hi john uh, hello tony hello adam hey, it's good to have you back on our hangout we're going to be talking about well, uh, telescopes and the, the different the different kinds. And I guess I'd like to get, let's see, what should we do? Should we just go ahead and just start describing the different kinds of telescopes and then we'll give our opinions on them? Is that, what, is that the way we should go? I think so. We'll try Fine, that. Yeah. Uh, sure. So, all right. <coughs> telescopes are in 
all over the place. You've seen them, but the uh, there's there's many different kinds of designs, and we're only going to go into two of them today because uh, there are many more besides this. There's also uh, Schmidt cast grains and other kinds of telescopes. So uh, there we'll we'll bring those up in different hangouts. But today we want to talk about refractors versus reflectors. Now refractors are a very simple. Well, they're, both telescopes we're going to talk about are relatively simple designs. And since I don't want to do all the talking, how about I get, um, how about I get, Adam, why don't you tell us about refractors? I'll have one up. You tell us how they work, and then I'll have John talk about reflectors. Okay. So I have, the, and I have, and Jay, I know you can't see it, but I have the uh, diagram of the refracting telescope up. Okay. The one you so saw. a refractor bends light using a lens have lenses so that the light enters the telescope through the lens passes down the tube and the light is focused into an image in front of an eyepiece uh, refractors have been around for a long long time Galileo that was the first one wasn't it <clears throat> well I don't think, I don't think he was the first one but that's true Hans one. Hans Lippershey developed invented the telescope so he was the first yeah one. But Galileo used a refractor to, uh, he, he looked at the craters on the moon, he discovered the phases of Venus, and of course he discovered the uh, Galilean moons. Around Jupiter. With a very simple, small refractor telescope. Basically, when we're talking about refractors, think glass lens. That's because that's basically what they are. Right, and, in uh, our... In our, but they take two, don't they? At a minimum, they take so two lenses. Some of them even, it depends. The, the more expensive ones can have as many as four. Right, but I mean, the most basic refracting telescope requires at least two lenses: one at the front, which is the objective lens, and the other one, at the, and another one in the back, which people call an eyepiece lens. But you need you need both, don't you? Or can you just use one? Yeah. No, you need five. Right. So it has two lenses uh, on the on this diagram here. There's one on the right side of the diagram where the light is coming in and then being focused down into a point, which then goes through and is made parallel by the, the, the rays are made parallel again by the second lens or the eyepiece lens in this case. And um, you can focus by moving that eyepiece back and forth. And... Uh, that's a very simple, this is like a Galilean design. Um, you can take, you can even take two lenses without even a telescope tube and hold them up. Um, and you know, just kind of hold them up. Let me get rid of this. You can hold them up like this and just, you know, with the objective here and your, your smaller lens here, and you can just look through them and, and kind of depending on the focal length, of course, if it's within your arm length, then, uh, then you can do it. But, um, here in this example, the distance that it goes from the, Objective all the way back to the eyepiece is called the focal length, or the point at which it goes to this point. Actually, is the focal length of the tel of the telescope itself, and that varies. It can it can be any number you want, but um, we'll talk a little bit more about focal length in a bit. But uh, yeah, that's that's so that's refractors. Uh, John, tell us about reflectors, and I have that up. Right, the um, instead of using um, a lens at the front of the um, telescope, it uses um, a Newtonian reflector. And I also include the um, Dobsonian reflectors in this. Mm -hmm. They use a, a convex mirror at the back to um, send light onto a secondary flat mirror um, set at 45 degrees, which then reflects the light up into the eyepiece. Um, they're much bigger than refractors, um, but size for size cheaper. Yep. And they typically, so here you've got just a mirror, one surface of the mirror has to be, it, it, you know, is, is being used uh, for the reflection. Whereas in a refractor, the whole thing is being, you got the whole piece of glass has to be in really good shape so the light can travel through it. So that's a big difference. There's refractors, there's reflectors. Now here's a picture of one. This is a, um, let me get it up here. Let me get rid of that. Uh, that is a refracting telescope and i have up here a takahashi this is one of the top of the line refractors you can buy uh this is like a four inch it's a wide field one because the tube is very short 
but um look at that that's very sleek it's very um <laughs> it's very like it looks like a sports car right it's very 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 nice and fast and here is an example of a reflector this is a dobsonian reflector a newtonian reflector just so i'm complete and john doesn't get mad at me um <clears throat> but these are a little bit short a little bit squat um <clears throat> not quite as sexy as a, as a refractor uh so you kind of have short and dumpy and sleek and, and fast uh, kinds of telescopes. But uh, we're going to talk a little bit about what each one can do. But uh, that's the, the, the behind the scenes, what, what's going on with each kind of telescope. And um, I don't know. Uh, the So, Adam, let me ask you, um, uh, what do you think the, uh, you know, the, 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 what's the advantages, first of all, of, of these two telescopes what, that, you, that you can think of? Diffractors are good at producing a very crisp image with high contrast. So, for example, if you were to look at the moon, you can see the mountains on the moon, you can see craters, you can see very distinct features. And they're, they're good for looking at planets in the solar system refractors as well. But they're not as good at looking at deep sky objects as a reflector. Reflectors are better at looking at dim, distant objects. Okay, why do you basically. think... So why is that, John? Oh, oh. Are you, are you there? Oh, uh, oh yes, me. Um, <laughs> it's, it's the um, light gathering or um, potential of a, a refractor that is limiting. Um, unless you get something like a six-inch refractor, which is going to cost um, oh, a thousand or more, um, you're not going to get the um, light gathering potential that you would with a, with a reflector. So why not? I mean, why can't you get a really, really big diameter refracting telescope? Um, well, the biggest I've seen is... Um, in life is uh, six inch uh, that was a triplet I think so instead of having just um, one lens at the front it's got th um, three um, sets of lenses at the front to, to um, get rid of um, chromatic aberration um, it's heavy very heavy and it's very expensive but why why do you think why is why are they so expensive lots more glass Lots more glass. That's right. So if you look at, if you look at this this uh, this thing, pull up this refractor again. This light thing, this that piece of glass has to be pristine, and its and its its surface has to be, you know, both both surfaces not only have to be precisely ground, but the glass can't have little bubbles in it. It can't have little flaws, cracks, or any of that kind of stuff. So you need to find a really good piece of glass to make a refractor. Well, four inches. Is you know a, a sixty millimeter lens is pretty easy to make, relatively inexpensive and high quality. A four inch lens is going to be even is going to be exponentially more expensive to make. And forget about ten inch or twenty inch uh, refractor refracting objective lenses. I was at the I think it was the Yerkes Observatory in Chicago, and they had the largest refracting telescope in the world, which was twenty inches. And that cost millions of dollars to make. It's still in use. You can still go and look through the telescope. They don't do much with it anymore because of the uh, location it's in. But the uh, th that's it. 20 inch is about it. I mean, because you think about finding a 20 inch piece of glass that is absolutely perfect and flawless, and then you've got to grind it and make it make the shapes uh, on it as well. Um, that tends to make it big. But by reflectors, by comparison. Adam, you want to talk about those? They're relatively cheap because... Because it doesn't take as much money to make a mirror, basically. So you can get large diameter, uh, large diameter mirrors for uh, only one surface of that piece of glass has to be perfect, right? You can have a really big, thick piece of glass, but only the, the outside surface has to be perfect. Yeah, and and so, um, so they can be made larger, more more less more inexpensively, and then they do, and and then you know how do they make them? What do they do to the mirror surface to make it reflective? What do they put on there? Well, it's silvered. 
It's it's. It, do they put silver on there? It's silver. No. It's huh? uh, aluminium. Um, aluminium. Right. That's right. It's aluminium oxide. Usually it's out. Right. Usually it's some kind of aluminium. I'm going to be American and say aluminum. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, because it's highly reflective, you just need some. You could actually use. Couldn't you guys? We could actually use a, an unpolished mirror as a telescope, couldn't you? I mean, it would still reflect. Yeah. Well, the mirrors on um, a Newtonian uh, um, coated on the surface. If they coated the um, on the on the front surface, if they coated the back surface, uh, you'd get reflections. You get a, like a ghost image. Reflect the ba- oh yeah, but you wouldn't want to do that. Oh, I see what you mean. Right, because there is no coatings. Part of the reflection would go through the glass, or part of the light would go through the glass. Yeah, so you don't want to do, but you could, in principle, use just the blank um, as a as a primary. But you're right; you would get a lot of artifacts out of that. So. Um. I think the, the, the there's some solar um, Newtonian telescopes where they don't mirror the um, surface of the yeah you know, they don't cut the surface of the mirror. Really? So it is just a, bl- a blank piece of glass. Oh. So only a tiny part of it comes back onto the um, onto the um, 45 degree diagonal, the secondary mirror. Yeah, right. And the, of course, the point of that is. You want to reflect yeah, as much light. light as much as much light as you can when you mirror the surface. But with no mirror, you don't. With the sun, you've got plenty of photons. You don't need to collect all of them. You can throw a lot of them away. In fact, you want to throw a lot of them away. So there's no point. That's now. right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm, it's just re- occurred to me. I'm looking. I have something. Hold on just a second. I can't believe I still have this, but this was just sitting in my drawer. This is a very old, very messed up 8-inch mirror. And I'm going to do this. I hope it doesn't, like, screw things up. But this is the mirror blank itself. It's got... There's my light. Uh, Let me see if I can get it closer. You can see all of the scratches. This is very... This is in very bad shape. But the aluminum... All this needs... All this needs... Is, a, is to be repolished. In fact, I could probably clean some of this up. But you can see how thick it is. This was made by a company called Criterion back in the 1980s. And this is just a Pyrex mirror blank. It says... Actually, let me make me full, full screen here. Let me get rid of that so you can see this better. And this is a Pyrex mirror blank. It's about an inch and a quarter or so, maybe two centimeters thick. Um, it, you can't see the curve on it, but it's got one. Uh, and the shape of the curve is a parabola because a para- parabolic curve is what focuses, focuses it on a, uh, to a point. And so that's what focuses the light ray. So this is a reflecting mirror. I paid a couple hundred dollars for it. No, I paid more than that. I paid like $500 for it. Uh, back in the day, but I've kept it and I've never actually used it for anything, but it's a very usable blank. Very good. It, this would be the basis of a Newtonian telescope. This would be the primary mirror. So that's eight inches or 20 centimeters if you're using the metric system. So there you go. That's that. I can't believe I, I remembered that. So that would be, um, and it's got the aluminum, the aluminum, al- aluminum coating on the top to make it reflective. Um, and that's in really bad shape, but anyway, so, um, <clears throat> refractors need lenses, binoculars have lenses. So it's a, they have two, uh, they have two, uh, basically refracting telescopes, put side by side. So they fit into your eyes. Uh, but, um, there, and as, as, uh, as, as Adam said, they're more expensive. They tend to be smaller because they're expensive to make. Um, another thing that goes into telescope quality, and I want to talk about this on both refractor, reflect, reflectors and reflect, refractors and reflectors is coatings. You're going to see the prices of these telescopes vary quite a bit based on the kind of coatings they have. For a refractor or for a reflector, it's just going to be aluminum coatings or maybe silver, but the silver will oxidize and you'll have to clean it a lot. Uh, but it'll it'll have this kind of coating. But for lenses, they have special kind of coatings. You guys want to talk about that a little bit? 
Well, it's the same as with um, uh, the camera lenses. They they put um, a coating on to onto the um, onto the lens, especially the front element, to um, stop the um, refraction and um, produce a, a better, sharper image. Yes, and I was I'm sorry I was reading I'm reading the chat and I got it wrong. David Lebhart is correcting me. The Yerkes had a 40 inch objective, not a 20, and so I stand corrected. Um, it's in it's in green. Are you sure it's in Greenville, South Carolina? What's in Chicago? I think it's in Chicago. I think it's near Illinois, um, but maybe I'm wrong. If it's maybe it's in South Carolina, unless they moved it. Um, but yeah, uh, the last I heard, it was it was near the it was near Chicago. But anyway, it was a 40 inch objective lens, and that was the largest in the world. I don't think, and you guys correct me in the chat if I'm wrong, and maybe you guys remember. Is there anything larger than a 20 inch or 40 inch refractor? Refractor. <laughs> Do you guys know of anything? I, I, I can't think of one. And by comparison, the largest, what's the largest reflector? It, it, it Single, I should say single mirror refractor, because if you go into things like Keck and stuff like that, you'll get much bigger. But it's about 100 inches, right? Well, you just get the 200 inch at Mount Palomar. Is that 200? Yeah. Okay. Then the Russians had a 202 inch. But that was um, a far inferior um, um, machine. Okay. So um, there you go. So again, it's easier because of refractors. You can take this. All you really care about is one surface. And the rest of this can be very faulty and messed up and have all kinds of bubbles in it and stuff. But another problem with big telescopes and of the 100, 200 inch variety uh, is that when you make glass big enough, it actually begins to act like a liquid and it flows. And so if you're turning this big giant telescope around all over the sky, the figure of that mirror or the shape of that mirror actually changes as you go to different, you know, attitudes. And, um, there's this famous story of a guy at McDonald observatory. And I forget the size of the telescope down there, but it's in, it's in Texas. An astronomer was very distraught. And this actually happened. An astronomer was distraught and uh, fired shots from a pistol into the primary mirror of the telescope at McDonald Observatory. And those holes are still there. It did not, ref it did not crack or break the mirror, but it did just put holes in it. They just kind of flowed around the bullet. Um, and that didn't mess up the figure. It didn't mess up the, the uh, shape of the mirror at all. They still use it to this day. So... Um, Glass is very funny stuff, especially at very big sizes. Now, you guys aren't going to go out and buy a 200-inch telescope but, um, but or a 40-inch um, refractor. But these sort of illustrate the pluses and minuses of the different ones. Now, uh, John, you actually, you, you were telling us on the first Hangout that you have diff both kinds of telescopes. What kind of telescopes do you have? I've got, Just um, remind us. I've got two refractors. Um, a 70 mil and a 102 mil. Um, an 8 inch or 200 mil um, uh, Newtonian reflector and a 120, 127 mil um, Maxitov Cassegrain, which is a kind of hybrid, a, um, a mix between the refractor and the reflector. But I think we're going to be talking about those types in a later. Yeah, yeah, we'll go into some of the more complicated ones. Uh, now, do you guys find, and both of you comment, please, Adam, chime in whenever you want. Uh, do you, the are the refractors versus reflectors their size, their overall size? Which do you find easier to use? Refractor. Refractor. So you do you say would you guys say that you use them more than you use your reflectors, or just because Absolutely. of that? I mean. They're, because they're easy to get outside, aren't they? That's right, yeah. Yeah. So I, I am going to be making um, a Dobsonian mount for my reflector, which will mean I can get it, take it outside a lot easier and um, start viewing faster. Yeah, what's it currently mounted on? Uh, it's an equatorial. Okay. It's a go to, so it's yeah. all the cables and everything to set up, and it's a pain in the bump. 
It is. <laughs> 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 Don't worry, folks. We're going to get into mounts. That's a whole topic right in itself. So we'll get into those in later in later hangouts. But right now, we just want to talk about refractors and reflectors. So yeah, refractors tend to be smaller because hey, you know, uh, they are smaller. Four inches about the biggest anybody can afford. Now Takahashi, that one I showed you was about a $4,000 telescope, I think, if you include the mount and everything else with it. The optics on it, though, are primo. I mean, they, <laughs> they, and there's this new thing, well, we should probably talk about focal length now, but uh, the, there's this new thing about, it's not new, it's been around for a couple decades, about short focal length, um, short focal length refractors, and that's what I want to bring up now. Another big difference historically between refractors and reflectors is one of, well, you've got glass in front of a refractor. You've got a mirror in the back of a reflector, but they are generally, they have different focal lengths as well. The, the um, refractors tend to be longer. They have real long tubes and refractors tend to be short and stubby. Now, you guys want to talk about that a little bit, about why that is? Maybe why the focal lengths of the different... Not not always, but historically, refractors have had long <coughs> focal lengths compared to their diameters as refra- reflectors do. Do you guys want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, the, um, the easiest way to answer that is to say that a longer focal length um, telescope reduces the amount of light you get at the eyepiece and also reduces the... Um, any the effect of any faults in the um, optics right and so they one of the reasons that they 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 all so if you look if you think back to the shape of a of a refractor i'm just going to use my hands so this will be the front part of the lens this will be the back part of the lens they tend to have a a curve like this and how much it's curved will determine how much the light bends but the more you try to do that on a refractor, the more it tries to bend light, then the more you start to see something called chromatic aberration and other artifacts, just fuzzy images, you, astigmatisms, things like that that you can't get out if you have a very short or very long focal length telescope that's curved a little bit. So this would be a long focal length telescope. This would be a short focal length refractor and making this is easy, making this is hard and expensive. And also you have to add corrective lenses to get rid of all the other crap that comes along with making that bend. So that, so, so refractors to keep the cost low tend to have curves like this real shallow. And these are very expensive, but, but to do this means you've got a long focal length. And remember that's that distance that it takes the telescope to focus light to a point that has two effects on it, on what you're going to see in a telescope. Long focal length telescopes mean, well, why don't, I don't want to do all the talking. Do you, do you guys want to, you want to, Adam, how about telling us, do you want to talk about the difference between fields of view and long focal length versus short focal length telescopes? Yeah. Okay. You'll get a wider... It, when you think about looking for a telescope and what kind of telescope you want to buy, you have to think about the field of view and how wide the field of view is. And that That's how much of the sky you can see. Yeah, exactly. You're looking... Basically, you're looking for a straw. Do you want to be able to see great detail... A, a tiny patch of the sky, or do you want to see a slightly patch of the sky, like the whole of the moon? And the, you have different types of telescopes and do different things. Often it's a compromise. You're compromising between being able to get a crisp, high contrast image that shows you a lot of detail, but is a very small area of the sky or you can have a a wider view that uh, that's not quite so uh high contrast i guess that's right and you also have lower magnification too with the different fields of view uh higher higher uh, 
higher or or you know it's like it's like Adam said if you look at the sky it's like look it's like looking through a sky through a straw versus looking at it through say a a, a kitchen towel tube uh, if you it, that would be the difference between a, a refractor and a reflector you can see more of the sky at short focal lengths and because refractors are hard to make it's hard to get shorter focal lengths out of them uh, I have to laugh here um, uh, I'm reading some of the uh, uh, comments here. Where was it? <laughs> Kurt Simler first goes, are backyard telescopes worth a shit to buy or should I stick with binoculars? Then he changes that and he goes, sorry, are backyard telescopes worth the investment <clears throat> or should I just rely on my foldable binoculars? Yeah. Well, what do you guys, how do you guys respond to that? Binoculars are good. Um, uh, many um, astronomers as well as having telescopes will have um, at least one set of um, binoculars either in the 7 to 10 by 50 range or 15 by 70s, uh, 20 by 80s. But even 20 by 80, 20 times magnification, it will not beat a telescope. Yes. Uh, so... You can't it, take images either. What's that? You can't that? take a decent image. Yeah. You can't take a photo through a pair of binoculars. Not easily, <clears throat> although I think, yeah, I, yeah, you're right. You can't do it, uh, not not without a lot of haranguing, so it's not worth it. Uh, but, you know, Kurt, whether something is worth it to you or not, so, you know, you've you got to ask yourself, well, what, how worth it is it to you to go out on a dark night sky and see the rings of Saturn? Um, you do kind of have to know what you want to see, though, before you know what to buy. And so I think that's, that's a good segue into the next little part I want to talk about between refractors and reflectors, which is what can they best show you? Refractors for a given aperture tend to be more expensive than reflectors, but nothing can beat the view of Saturn or Jupiter or the moon or, or Mars. In my opinion, you guys are free to disagree with me on this, than a refractor. If you get a good, would you say you had a 60 millimeter, John? Um, yeah, six, um, well, a 70, and 70 millimeter. Okay. So you had a 70, and 102 mil refractors. Now you tell me, and you also have a Newtonian. You said you had a refractor. Yep. So all things being equal, which would you rather look at Saturn? For the, with? Um, for the planets, I would uh, use the uh, refractor. Why is that? Um, it's got oh, they've got a slightly a slightly longer focal length than the Newtonian. The Newtonian is in his Newtonian is f um, five. Yeah. Um, the um, refractor that I use the most is six point six. It, it's a little bit longer, but a little bit more magnification with um, a given eyepiece. And because of that, because because of the higher magnification and the fact that the planets are much, much brighter than, say, the Crab Nebula, when you look at a bright object like Saturn or Jupiter or the Moon, you really want... A, you don't need as many as, as much light collecting area as you do with, uh, with, say, looking at a deep sky object. So you get that, you get that refractor pointed at Saturn, and you're going to get a nice, bright... Very clear, very narrow field of view uh, picture or image in your eye that is unparalleled if you have a good refractor versus what you would see in the same or even larger uh, reflecting telescope because the refract the reflector is going to show you much more of the sky. The size of the planet will be smaller in your eyepiece, and it's just not as as satisfying. Now you can do it with a refractor, but we're going to talk about how you would do that. I mean, I'm a reflector. But we could talk about how to do that later. But yeah, I mean, what about you, Adam? What do you think? Reflectors uh, are great for looking at dimmer, deep sky objects. You can see bright nebula and bright galaxies with a refractor. But really, when you're talking about, uh, you know, things like supernova remnants and uh, distant galaxies, you need uh, a decent aperture reflector. But beautiful images you can't beat a refractor you can get you can take absolutely beautiful pictures of uh, saturn jupiter the moon very easily with a refractor they're, they're, 
They're low maintenance. They're much lower maintenance than a, a reflector. Reflector telescopes need collimating, which means you have to uh, make sure the mirrors are aligned. You don't have to do that with a refractor. You have to clean them, keep them clean, but they're relatively low maintenance. That's a good point, actually. I, that's do. Yeah, that's a really good point. Um, you do need to, if you keep so the dust cover on it, the refractors will stay pretty clean, but you're right yeah, about Yeah, and they don't degrade. Mirrors, as you said, mirrors degrade over time. A mirror will lose perhaps 1% of its surface will will disappear. Over and, and it will look week. like this after a decade of sitting in your drawer. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> yeah, they do degrade. Ref refractor won't, won't deteriorate, and it will be as good in, in 10 years' time as it is brand new. And the, to be fair, the reflector will too. You're just going to have to get it recoded. You're going to need to take the mirror somewhere and get it re-illuminized or re, uh, re-coated with whatever coatings you had on it. Now, sometimes today in today's day and age, you buy a new Tony and they tend to illuminize the surface and then they put stuff over it, don't they? To kind of protect that coating a little bit more. There's yeah, like, they, do, they do put um, a protective coating over the top of it. D yeah, right. So it tends to last longer, right? Yeah. Yeah. So you don't... I mean, aluminum was better than silver. Silver was the worst because it oxidized in like a, a month. Uh, and you were always cleaning it with, you know, some kind of silver cleaner. But um, but the other stuff, the aluminum stuff didn't work. It lasted a lot longer. And now they have other coatings. And that... I don't know if we should... We should, probably shouldn't get into that. But that should be the topic of another hangout. Is all the different coating choices that you have. Magnesium chloride for... Um, for refractors, you have, you know, Schmidt Cassegrain coatings, all these different things. So low anti-reflection coatings, things like that. We should talk, we'll talk about that another time. Um, but, uh, they do degrade. That's right, Adam. That's true. Um, uh, Kurt's going, I want to see the rings of Saturn, the moons of Jupiter. I've never seen them for myself. Um, oh man, I wish you, you got to do that. Uh, binoculars are fine to get stoned and look at the moon, but I want to see the clouds on Jupiter. <laughs> <laughs> fair enough um yeah you need to get yourself uh if those are the things you care the most about um a nice inexpensive refractor would be a, a good way to go because there's, there's nothing better uh than looking at saturn through a refractor in my opinion now what about that's not that's not to say that you can't look at the planets through a newtonian oh i know that no 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 i don't mean to say that you can't at all i'm just saying the views in comparison is hard to beat so let's just summarize a little bit. Refractors, very, they're small, smaller for the aperture because of their expense to make and the fact that they've got a lot of, uh, that you need really good quality glass to make them with. Um, they tend to have longer focal lengths because you don't want a lot of curve in them. With that. Every time you make a big curve and you, you introduce a, uh, another aberration, things like astigmatism, like I said, and, and chromatic aberration, and to get rid of that, you have to add other lenses behind it to correct for that. So it just adds to the expense. Uh, reflectors, big, relatively inexpensive for their size, and will show uh, they can collect a lot more photons. So that means that reflectors are very good for very dim and faint objects that are big in the sky, and refractors are very good for bright, small things that don't take up as much room in the sky, like planets, the moon, and if you've got the proper solar filter, um, a uh, the sun uh, for refractors. Um, now, with reflectors, we haven't talked much about those yet, but um, what are some of your favorite uh, deep sky objects that when you were first getting started, guys, and you and you had your reflectors out, what were what were the best? What were some of your favorite objects to look at? The um, Great Nebula in Orion. The Orion Nebula. That's yeah. exactly what I was going to say. My first, my first was the Andromeda Galaxy. That was the very first thing I ever found with a six inch reflector and I didn't even, I found it about 20 times and didn't even realize it. <laughs> I had scanned by it so many times I kept missing it, but all it was was a little faint smudge uh, in the eyepiece. So let's talk a little bit about that. What can you expect to see with a reflector on some of these deep cut sky objects? What do they look like to you? When you saw the Orion Nebula, for example, guys, what'd you see? Well, the Orion Nebula is um, one of the exceptions um, when you're viewing um, deep sky objects because it is so brilliant you can see it with a naked eye 
and through a telescope you can see all these all the clouds um no color or very rarely any color you can sometimes see a patch of green or something like that nowhere near like what you would get in a um, in a photograph um, but when you're looking at something like um, the Andromeda Galaxy, all you will see is a, fo it's a thin blob, um, fuzzy blob. Because all, you're actually look all you can actually see is this bright centre part of the galaxy. Um, if you could see the entire galaxy with our naked eye, it would be six moon diameters in length. But all we see is a faint fuzzy blob in the centre. <laughs> yeah. That's right. And uh, what about you, Adam? You got any comparison? Any, any examples? Um, any of the objects that are in uh, the Messier catalog, you can find using a, a reflector. Yeah. Yeah. But I guess what I wanted to emphasize in this particular part is don't be expecting to go out in your backyard with your with your new telescope and seeing what Hubble sees. You're not going to see that. Uh, those Hubble images were processed or by many uh, dozens of images besides the Hubble telescope is up in space and has a better vantage point than you're ever going to have. So you're not going to get Hubble views through the eyepiece uh, of these telescopes, but you will see faint smudges. In the Orion Nebula, you might even see some green color. You'll definitely see the four stars at the center, uh, the trapezium, uh, if you look carefully. Um, and so... Uh, I was going to say, you'll see diffraction spikes as well with a, a reflector, which is not a plus, but it's what you see with Hubble as well. That's right. Diffraction spikes are the little artifacts that come from diffraction from the, the little spider veins that hold the secondary mirror. And the secondary mirror, let me just put up my refractor or my reflector again. Um, the, the, the light comes in from the tube, bounces off the primary objective mirror, and then hits this thing called the diagonal mirror. That's the secondary. And then it focuses up into the eyepiece. That has to be held up by something. And they hold it up with the little, little rods, uh, in the center of the tube. And those, as the light goes around those little rods, it makes little diffraction spikes. So that's what, uh, that's what, uh, Adam was talking about there. So, um, uh, I think diffraction spikes look cute. I like them. Yeah, I do too. They they make it look like you're looking at an actual star. Uh, Philip W is asking apologies, but is a is a Celestron Next Star Six a reflector or a refractor? I haven't got one of them. Those isn't are that, isn't that a category? It is. Yeah, uh, that is a a different. It is a reflector to answer that question but it's a special kind of reflector. It's called a schmidt cassegrain and we're not talking about those here because they're more complicated, but they tend to, they have the advantage that they can, they have a very short tube, much shorter than a Newtonian for the given focal length um, because they fold the optics back. And we're going to talk about schmidt cassegrains in another hangout. But to answer your question, it's a reflector. It's six inches in diameter, but it has a, and the reason you might think it's a refractor is it has this thing out front that's a, called a corrector plate. And that's not a lens. It's just a, a little plate that's that's ground in a certain way that causes it to let the, the, the mirror in the back of a Schmidt Cassegrain isn't parabolic like a Newtonian. It's spherical. And it does not a spherical mirror does not focus to a point, but a a, parabo a parabola does. And this that corrector plate causes the um, spherical mirror to be able to focus down to a point and so that's that's what that's for but we'll talk about those in another one um how do you see and uh, galaxia hey it's good to see you back galaxia um how do you see andromeda in a 16 inch dobsonian as a little bigger smudge <coughs> that's a good question so let's say you had a six inch telescope guys and you're looking at the ring nebula m57 and you see it a certain way in a six inch. And then you got your 12 inch out, twice the size. What's the difference are you gonna see? Same eyepiece, by the way, same same eyepiece. And let's also say same focal length. <laughs> F6s <laughs> on both of them. You're gonna well, collect more light with a bigger aperture telescope. It'll be. So more of the photons from that ring nebula are going to travel from there to your telescope, bounce off the mirror, 
and you're going to see them through the eyepiece. So, so be... you, you might you see a more distinct ring nebula in the eye through the eyepiece. It wouldn't appear bigger and not particularly. Yeah, I was careful to say all things there. all things are equal, focal length, field of view, yeah, all of that. But it would be a more distinct image. You'd get a better look at it. It would, wouldn't a it? Telescope. Yeah. yeah. It would be it would be brighter. And you might, because it has a larger, the thing a, a diameter of a telescope gets you is two things, more photons and higher resolution. And that means more detail. And if you look carefully at the both images, the six inch will be just dimmer. You might not see as much, as many features as you would with a 12 inch. You, it would be brighter, easier to see, and you might pick out more detail. I'm assuming, I'm of course. just going to go and get something quickly. What's that? Going to get oh, he already something. took it. All right, so John will be back. <laughs> I love the informality of this hangout. I don't have to, like, drive all of it. We could just do whatever we want. Um, George Caldwell is commenting, I personally refer, prefer my reflector for deep sky observations since it doesn't absorb any light from the already distant dim objects as a reflector can. Wait a minute. You mean you prefer your refractor for deep sky, George? You said reflector twice. So, um, yeah. Okay. So, yeah, clarify that for me, George, will you? Um, and let's see. I'm just going through some more of the chat here. I mean, it would be nice to use a giant reflector, but usually I conceive only refractors to watch planets and nebulae. Um, and, and, and as Scanio Vitale is commenting, since not many people are among us aren't millionaires, I am wondering what does a reflector come when does a reflector come in handy since they let you see less distant objects at the same cost of a refractor? Hang on, let me parse this, Escanio. I'm not I'm not getting that. Uh wondering when does a refract when does a reflector come in handy since they let you see less distant objects at the same cost of a refractor? No, you see more distant objects in a reflector, typically, Escanio, than, than a refractor. Um, refractors don't show you as much deep sky objects for two reasons. They have small diameters and long focal lengths, which means they see smaller parts of the sky, and they generally have a higher magnification. And I want to get into magnification in a minute. Uh, John, did you want to show something, or did, are you good? Yes, it's um, <clears throat> a very good book that I can recommend. Ah, good. I like that. Recommend well, a book. Turn left at Orion. You see that? Ah, yes, I've seen that book before. Who wrote it? Um, Guy Consul Magno. Ah, yeah. Guy Consul Magno and Dan M. Davis. That's the guy. Easy to to pronounce. (laughs) And what? (coughs) Why do you like that book? Well. Instead of looking at views uh, from Hubble and trying to find the same thing in um, in your telescope, uh, this book gives um, drawings that people have done at the um, eyepiece, such as this one. Trying to get it. Yeah, hold it real steady for us, okay? Yeah. Can you see that? Yeah. So that that, that big circle. Nebula. That big circle is the is the field of view. That's right, yeah. yeah. Okay, and inside are what you can expect. Oh, that's nice. I, I had heard of the book, but I didn't buy it. So, that's great. So, can you get this on Amazon? Uh, yes, it's... Um, the author is... Um, not expensive. The author is the Pope's astronomer. Is this what? Father, he's, he's the Pope's astronomer, the Vatican's astronomer. Oh. Recognize his name. Oh. His name is Father Guy... And he uh, is a very, very well-known astronomer. Yeah, he's, he uh, searches the universe on behalf of the, His Holiness the Pope. I always thought that was impressive that the Catholic Church had their own observatory. I was... <laughs> yeah. yeah, it was like after Galileo, they weren't going to make that mistake again, right? So... <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. they were funding Galileo. All that stuff about him being um, ostracized by the church and it's... A lot of it was made up. <laughs> yeah. Okay, he's, well... He's, he's been financed by the church. 
Okay, wait a minute. Now you're saying he wasn't he wasn't imprisoned and all that stuff. Oh, um, that, that's a different that's a different conversation, I guess. But yeah, different. Yeah, yeah. Oh, Philip W has posted links to Amazon. You know, guys, what we need to do is go start getting affiliate links in here so we can uh, we can get, <laughs> we can get some uh, income for this. Yeah, we uh, that, that that that's a good link, Philip. So thank you for that. And uh, um, that's a good. Thanks for the book recommendation too, uh, John. I appreciate that. that. We need to start doing that more. I think in these hangouts. Um, all right, where was I? Oh, I want to talk about God. We're almost out of time. I want to talk about magnification a little bit. Um, this this should probably be an entire hangout topic, but I just want to briefly say, and I I want to get your guys' thoughts on it. Sorry, there's a fly in here. Um, magnification is a myth. Do not ever. We said this in the first hangout. Do not ever buy. A 1,000 power telescope. You're never going to use it. You're not going to see anything out of it. And it doesn't mean a thing. One Magnification is typically in the range. I've always used the, the, the range between 20 and maybe 50 power. That's if I'm doing this visually. And I'll, we'll talk about more about how you make magnification change in, in different ones. But if I'm, if I'm over 100 power, I better have a darn good mount and a really good and no wind Nobody can sneeze. Nobody can walk around my telescope or anything else. Uh, so forget magnification. And in, in, in the context of our conversation today, refractors tend to have a higher magnification because they have longer focal lengths. And they will, that means that you will see, not only will the planet Saturn be bigger in the eyepiece and it will be magnified, the size of it, but so will any any faults in the atmosphere, the turbulent seeing will also be magnified. So will any vibrations near the telescope that will also be magnified. And so it's a it's a very you can keep popping in more more higher powered eyepieces, but the minute you do that, you're going to see fuzzier images, bigger fuzzier images, and they're going to shake and boil and roll around in your eyepiece. And you may as well not even go out and look. That's my spiel on on magnification. You guys, thoughts. Well, <laughs> Well, it's, it's, um, magnification is also um, a factor of um, the um, diameter. Yes, yes, it so is. So you're not, not going to get as much magnification mm. from a 70 mil um, refractor as you are from a 90 mil or 100 mil. Yes, I think, I think yeah. the the um, one figure that gets bounced around is. Um, 50 times magnification for each um, inch of diameter of the lens, the primary lens, or the mirror. I'd so, say that's too much. I'm, I'm, I tend to go towards 40 times. 40 times the diameter of the mirror? Well, 40 uh, times magnification. Give me an example. Uh, so inch. an 8-inch an eight mirror means you can go to what? 320 um, power? Yeah, the... well. If you've got a two, um, yeah, if you've got a two-inch mirror, or two, sorry, two-inch um, refractor. Um, you're, you're looking at about eighty times magnification. If you've that's got the most. Inch, that's the most you could go with that telescope. The highest practical uh, magnification. I never, I never heard that rule of thumb. That's interesting. And that's. Are you talking about only refractors or reflectors too? And reflectors, yeah. Okay, so forty times um, per inch. That's. That seems like a lot. That would be a 400 times for a 10-inch mirror. Well, there's somebody I know who's got a 12-inch mirror, and he quite often goes up to 300 times magnification. Wow. Okay. Well, they must have a hell of a mount. <laughs> I can tell you now, I have never had a, a, a pleasing visual experience through the eyepiece at anything above 100 power. Everything else, Everything has always been crap over a hundred power. So, uh, but maybe, you know, I, I, and I've only used the best telescope I've ever had visually was a 12, um, a 10 inch me Schmidt cast that had a decent mount, but it was, it still vibrated like crazy over a hundred power. So I tended not to use it as much at that magnification. Um, so let's see. Um, okay. I'm just gonna, uh, what I, Adam, you got any, you got any thoughts on magnification? We didn't, have, we didn't get your input. No, the only thing I, I can think of to add is what John was saying earlier about chromatic aberration in refractors. 
small refractor telescopes tend to suffer from chromatic aberration where you get like a purpley violet colored halo mm -hmm. around the object you're looking at yeah there are some some uh better refractors on the market now that deal with that by having cleverer lenses basically but as, as we've already said that they can be very expensive but you can get totally get rid of chromatic aberration now and use a refractor to, do, to get really sharp good good images of solar system objects but uh if you want to impress people you're gonna have to spend some money yeah and i just want to what we should probably make this a, a topic also guys but refractors have also but they're also wide field deep sky refractors that you can buy now too uh, we should talk about those in another episode but i just wanted to go we're right now we're doing the basics refractor reflector and there are there are now some new like i said the takahashi uh, f6s these are real nice wide field telescopes but boy do you pay for that uh and they're beautiful apochromatic Apo i think they're called Ap that's right that means yeah yeah what does that mean it means uh, no problem, basically. Yeah, that's right. They it, means, it means they're expensive. It means they're expensive, yeah. and they've corrected <laughs> for any of the chromatic aberrations. If you take any lens at all and you make one, you're going to get chromatic aberration if you do nothing else to it. In other words, put another lens to correct for it. Because by itself, the lens Galileo had was awful. You could see colors all throughout the edge of the field of view. If you can make a, a replica, they call them the Galileo scopes, and, and you hold them up and you look at them, and, and you can see chromatic aberration just all over the place. But an apochromatic... No wonder the, no wonder the church argues with them. Yeah, <laughs> what are these colors, man? <laughs> You're seeing colors, dude. Um, all right, so I want to get to Philip W.'s question before we leave, because this is a good one. He's asking, uh, can you please recommend a good place to buy a second-hand telly for under a 1,000 pounds? And because he said pounds, I'm assuming he's in the U.K. And since you guys are in the U.K., if you wanted to go somewhere uh, to buy a second-hand telescope, and I know we talked about this in the first Hangout, but let's talk about it again, where would you go? Well, I've never actually looked for second-hand telescopes, but um, oh, actually, yeah, a local astronomy club. I got um, three of my telescopes um, second hand. I think they're looking for them. They just um... <laughs> you didn't you didn't walk I, away I didn't, with them, did you, John? I, you didn't like oh these are great telescopes. <laughs> I just happened upon them um, great little deals. Um, no, yeah, that's, good. that's actually people good in, advice um, because yeah, you... people in astronomy clubs, you know, they're, they're getting new telescopes all the time. And then they want to get rid of the old stuff. And if they know that you are after a refractor or a reflector, you know, it's a good bet that they'll um, get in touch with you. How about you, Adam? You got any suggestions? I've got no problem with saying, uh, with have a look on eBay or places like that, but you need to know exactly what you're buying. You need to know the spec of, of the telescope you're looking at. What aperture is it? What's its focal length? Is it a reflector or a refractor? What sort of mount does it have? What sort of kit are you getting with it? Eyepieces? You need to know all this all this stuff in order to buy something secondhand. And and even then, you, you're taking a bit of a gamble on the on whether it's going to get to you in one piece and whether it's going to work. If you're happy to do that. Fine, you can get some great bargains. Absolutely, save lots of money. Right, and for those in the U.S., I'm going to say Craigslist because I sold my telescopes on Craigslist, and believe me, they got some good deals. I sold my 10-inch Schmidt Cass, including a, uh, a webcam that I was used for for uh, sort of a poor man's um, uh, adaptive optics uh, for imaging planets. I sold my computer controls. Uh, all of it for two grand, and that was a that was a deal. So, um, uh, because I had easily five thousand into that whole thing. So, Craigslist is a good place to look. You do need to know, as as Adam said, generally what's a good scope. And let's let's do that, guys. Let's just say there are some brands that if you find them, it's probably okay to buy, isn't it? 
Like if you found yeah. a Celestron, yeah. go. It's, it's going to be all right. It's not going to suck. Yeah. If you find something by Orion telescopes, those are probably going to be good. You don't got to worry about those. Um, Mead. Mead. Mead is a, that's right. Thank you. So if you find a Mead telescope out there, it, you probably you can't go wrong with buying it. You don't got to know a whole lot about it, but stay away from off brands you've uh, never heard of. Like I'm going to say Tasco. I don't think Tasco was a good brand. Oh. Um, no, don't buy, don't buy anything from Tesco. Yeah, any other things that you can? It's the only one I can think of. Are there other brands that you can think of? The simpler, I can think of, I can think of a few, but um, I don't want to open this place up for litigation. <laughs> Good boy. I don't care. Uh, so, but, but that's a good point. Uh, and and even if you did buy one of the lesser quality, um, we call them department store te- department store telescopes here in the United States, uh, you can you can salvage it somewhat by first of all throwing away all the eyepieces that came with it, buying some halfway decent ones that are lower magnification. But you can kind of salvage one if you do get a super cheap one. But the optics aren't going to ever be as good as you want. And so those brands, Celestron, uh, 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 what else did I say? Orion telescopes. and Skywatcher. Skywatchers are good ones. Um, and uh, Mead. Mead are also very good. Uh, and my absolute favorite, I showed you guys this earlier, but this is my favorite uh, telescope for Dobsonians. Let me get all my crap out of the way here so you can see it better. Um but this is a Mead Lightbridge telescope, and I love these things. They are they collapse down. They have these trusses on them. They collapse down so they can fit into the trunk of your car quite nicely. Uh, and uh, and I, I just think I think they're one of the better ones. They're a little bit pricey. I, I think the the ten inch is like eight hundred dollars or something like that. But that's brand new. I mean, you know, and so you can get you can get pretty decent deals on those. So that I recommend. That's one of my favorites. Um, and, I, and and John, you own several Celestrons yourself, right? Well, um, I've got a couple of um, two Skywatchers and one Celestron. Two Skywatchers, okay, that's right, and and yeah. one, so, that's right, okay. So yeah, so there you go. Uh, Philip W goes, oh no, I'm in Ireland. <laughs> I was just reboosting. Um, well, get your butt over to the UK. Get on a jet blue flight or what is it? Ryanair? Is that what it is? And get over there. Just take, what is it? 50 bucks to fly from Ireland to the UK now. Isn't it like super cheap? Just go over there. <laughs> I, don't think, I don't think it costs dollars. Huh? It costs pounds. Oh, of course. Yeah. Or euros. It probably costs him. <laughs> probably costs him euros. Okay. Woo. So, <laughs> uh, what about Gumtree? Do you guys ever use Gumtree out there? Well, we've got it. Um, I've never used it. But do they? Can you find scopes on that out there? Well, I, I think you can. Yeah. yeah. There, there is um, a dedicated astronomy um, site as well that deals with second-hand stuff. Oh yeah, well, I can't right. remember what the name is. Yeah. Cloudy nights. Cloudy nights. That's another one. Yes, thank you. We should have. We should have <coughs> done that. George Caldwell's saying, "Don't buy Tesco at Tesco." That's exactly right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, guys. Well, I guess we better stop there. We're gonna. I think next time we'll probably talk a little bit about mounts or maybe eyepieces. I'm not sure which we'll talk about yet. But um, j- just I want you know. So hopefully this discussion helped you guys learn the difference between refractors and reflectors and what they're good for, what they are best at. Um, there are some exceptions to some of these rules, but for basic refractors, for basic reflectors, you, uh, the, the, we've hopefully outlined the, uh, the pluses and minuses for you. So, um, I hope that, I hope that's helped you a little bit. Now we need to talk about all kinds of other things like mounts. We have to talk about eyepieces. We have to talk about all kinds of other things that are, are subjects all on their own. And we're also going to have a, 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 episode dedicated to magnification because i'm going to try and show you examples of that also here in the united states next month we have a solar eclipse coming up that is going to be outstanding i'm going to try and view it we're going to talk about good ways to view the sun as well in future episodes so i want to thank you guys all for watching us and sticking with us and for the great questions and comments so thank you all very much so adam john thank you this was good thank you yeah so hopefully, yeah, hopefully we will be back next week, right? Yeah, definitely. All right, good. All right, so we go to, hope you guys will join us. We'll talk amongst ourselves about what the topic will be. 
Uh, and we will uh, post that as soon as possible. I will be back. There will be no hang. Just a programming note. There's no hangout tomorrow. Exo Life hangout uh, because I've got another commitment. I, I won't be able to attend. So the next Exo Life hangout will be the following Wednesday. Uh, the Thursday hangout, the Astro Coffee hangout, is happening. It is going to be on the Dark Energy Survey with Carol Christian and members of the Dark Energy Survey who are exploring the characteristics and the nature of dark energy. So we will have them on this Thursday. So we hope you'll watch it. I'm going to make the events and put them all. Oh, and I keep forgetting to do this at the top of the hangout. If you want to learn which hangouts are coming up and where and, and what they're about, go to deepastronomy.com slash hangouts. I have a calendar there that you can click on the events and see what we're talking about and you can see what's coming up as well. Uh, so please check that out. Uh, deepastronomy.com slash hangouts. Okay. Well, that is it for this week, everybody. I want to thank you. I want to thank my my get, my co-hosts, uh, Adam Smith and John Suffolk, both from the UK, amateur astronomers extraordinaire, who help me uh, help you each week decipher the uh, the the technological problems from amateur astronomy. You know, guys, we should also maybe talk about some of the science that that you can do with amateur astronomy as well. Um, that should be a topic. That would be, Actually, a good, yeah, be a good one. Yeah, and there's a lot of lot of uh, science that can be done with these telescopes, and that people are getting involved in all the time. In fact, I, uh, Juno, the Juno spacecraft, just passed over the Great Red Spot today, and amateurs helped uh, in that effort. It was a collaboration, so there were lots of people involved, and amateur astronomers can get involved with NASA uh, as well. So it's another thing you can do with your telescope once you buy it. All right, guys. Well, that is it for this week. Thank you all so much for watching. And as always, keep looking up. Keep looking up.